Maker Camp. There, we have a fantastic show for you today. There is so much for you to see. That's right. Today is all about 3D printing. Today's guests take things from their imagination or from patterns they see in nature and use 3D printing to turn them into real life things. Our guest, uh, Carla Diana's book, Leo the Maker Prints, features main characters that the readers can print out on their very own machines. Plus, we have Jessica Rosencrantz of Nervous System, who uses creative coding to make artwork inspired by biology. And today's project, as we have every day, is a bowl made from yarn. We also have a special skill builder project, uh, printing from Thingiverse with Autodesk 123D Mesh Maker. So I am so excited to, to see those today. It will be awesome. So let's get ready to make something great. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Camp Director Paloma. And I'm Camp Dictator Sam. As always, post your questions in the comments bar and we'll ask them live during the show. And if you want to be on with us in the future, you can go to the Maker Camp homepage and fill out the form so that you can be along with us in the future. But first, before we bring on today's guests, let's head over to the counselors with the daily project. Counselors, over to you. Hey, Sam. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Counselor Nick. And I'm Counselor Sandra. We've gotten so many incredible pictures and videos of your projects. At Atotonico de Tula, campers are making stomp rockets. Wow, those stomp rockets are really turning out to be the project of Maker Camp so far. They are so impressive and so fun. I have loved the videos that we've seen with them, too. I mean, they go so far, especially if you get a really good jump start and get, get a lot of pressure on that stomp rocket. And the stomp rockets are flying at the Muncie Public Library. Looks like patterned duct tape there. Always, always a good addition to your projects, adding some super cool duct tape. Or in that case, really hot duct tape. Wah, wah. <laughs> And the robot challenge is on at the Buffalo Museum of Science. Those are some super cool robots. They are robot cheese. 
Coming to get you. <laughs> I'm placing my bets on the one on the right. That one looks like a beast. <laughs> Geometry is really, really the skill there. It is. At the Arundaqua Public Library, they're doing teardowns to see what makes electronics tick. When you, you know, when you first get your hands on a circuit board, you really just learn so much. It's, it's the best first experience for electronics, I think. We want to see your projects this summer, so take pictures and video of what you're working on and post them to the community page. Show us what you've made, what you learned, and what you're going to make next. The daily project today is yarn bowls. And uh, they work, um, you make them similar to a way a 3D printer makes plastic parts. It's a really fun project for makers of any skill level. But um, the way it works is uh, you take a, it's similar to a 3D printer because the way a 3D printer lays down plastic in this pattern here is the exact same way that we made this yarn bowl right here. You can see it's just one layer at a time wrapped around and around and around while you move up and up and up. So the, uh, the glue is, is just like the filament. So a couple things to keep in mind when you're doing this is um, we found it best when we used cotton instead of acrylic or wool because the, both of those tend to repel the glue and the cotton adheres really well. So, but you can make anything, not just bowls. It's a really simple one here. Post pictures of your projects and we'll share them on the Hangout tomorrow. Over to you at Maker Camp HQ. Thanks so much for sharing, counselors. Those bowls look pretty cool. And it is very much like 3D printing. You know, you just go around and build up each layer and make something awesome. So I want to see you campers get really creative with it. Definitely post that on the community page. But first, I want to jump on to our first guest. I love this guest and what, what she does. Uh, this guest is Carla Diana. She has been interviewed on MakeZine.com. She's been to Maker Fair. And she really loves the idea of taking 3D printing and making your imagination into reality. So Carla, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So excited to be here at Maker Camp. We're excited to have you. Hi, Carla. A lot of people see 3D printing as a way of making pretty useful, functional, everyday objects. Uh, but I'm told you see things a little bit differently. Is that true? Um, yes. Well, <laughs> I see it. I mean, I, I definitely see a lot of uses for 3D printing. And um, you know, definitely useful objects for our homes that we can download and um, and we can have designers all over the world, and uh, just with a push of the button, uh, we can have the things that they've created for our kitchens and our bathrooms. Um, but I also love the idea that kids will be able to design their own products um, from their imagination. Yeah, that's that's great. And you know, my favorite thing about your book is that you, the actual characters in the book, you can 3D print yourself, and that you you don't just cover one type of 3D printing. You cover all different types of 3D printing and really show the entire community. But you know, why don't why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because you mentioned uh, like using it in your kitchen. How else besides making like a cute little elephant tchotchke, How else can you use 3D printing in your daily life? Well, there are lots and lots of ways. Um, uh, you know, certainly for things like hooks and hangers and housewares or um, bowls or, um, you know, in uh, the Leo book, we have, well, we, have a, we have a series of musical instruments, including an ocarina. And um, we also have a character who wants to customize his um, home, and he loves eating microgreens, little green things that you put on your salad. And so he creates a way to have a cabinet handle that is also a planter for the microgreens. So there's a little slot here, and it goes right on the cabinet handle. And the cabinet handle you can also download. And then you know this can be something that's both decorative but also useful for two different reasons. I love that. That's, I think that's my favorite print from the book. Is it's so cool, like that that this is a really functional object, but it's also beautiful and interesting. Thanks. <laughs> well, it's definitely something unique. Um, so so credit to you for that. I'm told that you brought a project to share with the campers today. Uh, would you like to walk us through the inspiration and uh, and through the project a little bit? Yeah. So um, the. The project that I wanted to share 
um, is the uh, the sheep. And so, um, in the book, there is a um, there is a robot. So there's a main character who's a robot, and his name is Leo. And um, Leo asks Carla, the main character, to draw him a sheep, and she draws the sheep. And then um, what he does is he has a special kind of anatomy where he can actually take a tray and hold it above his head, and then his nozzle moves. And um, out of the nozzle comes the plastic, just like on your printer bot or your maker bot. And lo and behold, he prints the sheep. So the sheep for me represents something that's um, really imaginary, because in the book, Carla just starts with a drawing from her head. Um, but then something real, because in the book, Leo makes it, and then extra real, because in real life, people all over the world have been making these sheep. And you'll notice that there are two colors, which is a question that I get a lot. Um, but the one color is uh, printed first. Um, and then the second color is made with snap-in parts. So here you can see an unfortunate sheep that's missing its nose. Oh. No. But um, that's one of the projects that I wanted to share today. And um, I also have another project um, that's also from the book. But it's a fun project to do with kids because it involves kind of hacking the 3D printing process. And what you do, it's a shaker. And what you do is you start to print it. And then when the printer's halfway through, you pause it. And then you throw rice or beans or even little bits of filament. And then you have an instrument to go with the ocarina or the rubber band guitar or some of the other things in the book. That's a great idea, pausing the print. And thank you so much for sharing that and giving that little demonstration. I really like that idea. And that actually reminds me of our skill builder project for today. Uh, if you go to the Google Plus community page, you can check out that we have the uh, skill builder for printing with Autodesk 123D mesh mixers. So you can print Leo the Mako pr Maker prints. And we have. A <laughs> is fumble in my words today, but we have the, the uh, instructions there on the Google Plus community page, and I can't wait to see it. And, you know, we've printed that, that sheep in the office, and it's just the cutest print. I absolutely love it. Okay. It's really fun to play with the different colors, too, to see what you can come up with. Yeah, pretty adorable. So it seems like you're using a lot of uh, the power and capability of 3D printers as a way of expressing a very creative vision. What inspires you to come up with this stuff? Well, um, as a designer who's designed a lot of things, I know that we have a lot of emotion for our objects. Even though we may think that a bowl or a plate is something very boring, we actually, it reminds us of something, or we love it for a certain reason, or it reminds us of a character. And so I really love sharing all of those emotional things that make us love our objects and make us either connect them to a memory or a story like the things in the book or to you know, something that we've used ourselves. So a lot of people are taking the characters and they've been um, making their own stories with them. So I like to think about all of those ways that people might relate to the objects. OK, so it's really about taking a much more enriching experience than just a static object itself and building all of that into the object. Yes, exactly. Right, Really thinking about all of the ways that a people might have that object in their life. So if it's going to be out on a shelf all the time, what does it look like? And how does it relate to the books on the shelf? What does it remind you of? Very cool. And that's very true. I mean, the first thing that I ever designed, uh, like when you're talking about like the emotional connection, the first thing I ever designed was really simple. It was a little insert for a tripod, and it didn't. I mean, it didn't even work that well. But I was <laughs> it so worked beautifully. Give thank you, some Sam. Credit. Thank you, Sam. Uh, but I was so invested in the design that I was just like, this is the coolest thing that has ever been made by anyone in the history of ever, because I was so happy about it. And yeah. since then, I've gone to create a lot more, you know, visually interesting things, and in you know, using 3D printing. But mm -hmm. there's that emotional connection that's tied to each thing that you design yourself and that you create out there. So I think that 3D printing is really a great way to get in touch with that and mm -hmm. explore really interesting ideas. Yeah, 
You know, they say that uh, when people are confronted, if they suddenly discovered that woke up and their house was burning down, that they only had time to save one object, most people would take a photo album or a family heirloom. Very, very infrequently would people take an actual physical thing uh, mm. because of the lack of that emotional connection. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, way, a very creative and interesting way of building that emotional connection back into our everyday objects. I think that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. you're telling me that I should 3D print survival tools so they'll remember to bring them and have an emotional connection, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's really good strategic thinking. Yeah, it's, uh, not just a pretty face, Scarlett. <laughs> so, no, we keep her around for at least two reasons. <laughs> so I was just wondering, what kind of reaction have you seen? I mean, this is a really great book that's a, you know targeted for age five to eight, but what kind of reaction have you seen from people uh, with this, this new kind of children's book? Well, what's been really fascinating is, um, the, what, like I mentioned before, people making up their own stories. So they'll sometimes print the characters from the book, and they will pose them in different ways and look at Carla getting a nerd award or learning about the Mars. And um, So that's from a, a teacher named Design Make Teach, and Virginia has been doing a lot of those um, scenarios as ways to uh, teach kids about different things in addition to 3D printing. And another thing that I hadn't even imagined was that a library in Scotland has gotten their first 3D printer and they emailed me an article from their local newspaper that mentioned that they're using the characters with visually impaired kids and reading the story and allowing them to actually you know, hold the characters while the story is being read so that they can also appreciate if they can't see the illustrations, they can actually hold the characters and the objects that are in the story. And I just love that, and I hadn't even considered that. That's fantastic. Um, I wouldn't have thought of that either, but that's beautiful. I'm glad to hear that so many positive things are coming out of this. Yeah, uh, Carla, thank you so much for joining us. Stay on. Be sure to stay here because we'll be having a bunch of questions for you from the campers later. And okay. you know, but first, before we before we get to all those awesome questions, which campers, you better be coming up with something good because I want to hear good questions. You know, before we get to that, I want to bring in our next next guest, who I'm also very excited about. We have such an awesome show today. I'm I'm very happy about this. Our next guest is Jessica Rosencrantz of Nervous System, and they use math, yay math, and <laughs> uh, and programs to create some really interesting art. So Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It, you know, I just I want to know, I mean, you your company makes such interesting things. How did you come to the kind of making and creating that you're doing now? Um, well, it's sort of a long story, but really what happened was I was studying biology, and uh, I was working in labs at MIT as an undergraduate, and I got excited about a new form of art that I heard about uh, that was sort of is happening now. Basically art made by computers. People writing code to produce art and not writing code to produce uh, websites or browsers or accounting software, but writing code to express art and explore new things that you couldn't do any other way. And I took a class um, with a professor who was developing this form of art called John Mida, and I just became really fascinated by the idea that I could make art. I basically, I'm terrible at drawing and sculpting and all of those things, but suddenly by writing code, I could produce really interesting artworks and express myself in a way that I hadn't before. Um, so I started studying architecture, um, which at MIT is the only way you can study art. They don't teach art, actually. They only teach, art, teach architecture. Um, and then I ended up with a degree in biology and a degree in architecture, and I was thinking, how can I combine these things together to do anything? Um, and my partner, Jesse, he has a background in artificial intelligence and mathematics. And essentially, we wanted to work together, so we figured, what can we do that combines artificial intelligence, mathematics, computer science, architecture, and biology? And that, that's what we do, essentially. How can we combine all these things together to make products um, and to explore, essentially, what do you do with all this stuff? That I think is that the cool might have answered story. your question. It was a bit of a <laughs> yeah. story, though. Yeah. Okay. I love, I love that you were like, I want to just use everything that I know, so let me create a field that I can do this in. That's, that's an awesome story. That's terrific. Yeah, so how do you take all of this uh, natural stuff that you get and turn it into a physical object? 
Uh, well, a lot of times we start out with some sort of natural inspiration. So we'll say, we're interested in how veins form in leaves. Um, and the first thing we would do is, you know, obviously look at, at leaves and <laughs> look at the sort of patterns that form. But then we might end up going to scientific literature and reading a bunch of papers. So scientists are obviously interested in the same things that I might be interested in as an artist. Now, I'm interested maybe in the aesthetic forms or the function of leaf veins. Scientists are interested in why do those come about. So they've already written hundreds of papers proposing theories on what that happens. And what we do at Nervous System is we read those papers and we say, is there some sort of algorithm or tool here that we can adopt and then turn that into a design tool? So, you know, nature has a way of generating all of these structures from some set of rules or principles. Uh, and they can create incredibly complex and diverse patterns that vary based on, uh, let's say, environmental conditions or genetic differences. How can we take that and create designs that grow rather than designs that somebody just sits in the computer and says, I want a box here and I want a box here, et cetera. You know, what if your, your dress grew in a complex form that you could shape and modify rather than, you know, you just draw a simple shape and that's it. Um, so I think maybe there were some images or something, but maybe they... They didn't happen. Yeah, so actually, let's, let's go know. to some of those. <laughs> Let me pull up some of those images, and uh, why don't you go ahead and walk us through what these are? I think, I think we have some on hand. So tell us about what these are and what they mean. Sure. So this is just a photo of leaf veins that I shot, um, just showing the sort of uh, tree branching structure. But the interesting for us is, thing for us is how they form networks. So they actually, instead of just branching like a tree in a hierarchical fashion, they reconnect into a network. Uh, and they carry fluids through the leaf. So in this project, we worked with an algorithm that had already been developed by scientists, um, but we started playing with that and tweaking it and trying to find ways to create our own variations on that. So as you're watching this video, you'll sort of see how um, there are different modes of growing that produce different types of network structures. Um, so these are jewelry pieces that we designed using this system, and each one grows its own unique pattern um, so we might start with something that's essentially um, from science and then take it and explore its parameters and variations for the purposes of art and aesthetic exploration. So that's sort of what you're seeing in the video. That is beautiful and fascinating with the kind of fractal patterns. And then taking it even a step further, I mean, we're not really uh, limited in the way that nature is. Nature might always grow leaf veins on a surface. What if we want to think about growing them in 3D? So we um, did some explorations of taking this you know, to the third dimension. So we have these lamps that grow and form themselves. Um, this is a picture of radiolaria. They're microscopic um, amoeboid protozoa. They float around freely in the ocean. And what you're looking at are their skeletons, which are made of glass. They're made of silica. And they extrude them. Um, they're single-celled organisms, so they're very, very simple. But somehow, these simple organisms are able to construct very complex armatures around their bodies. We're just very inspired by these forms, um, particularly the way they use very small amount of material, but they create very strong, large structures. So what we were thinking is, could we take this idea um, of the radiolarian skeleton and turn that into a design tool that people could use to create 3D printable objects? Um, so what you're looking at now is a web-based application that we created um, that's based on just a, sort of a physical simulation of spring meshes. Um, making that something that you can do live in your browser to shape rings and bracelets or random cellular objects of your choice um, that you can 3D print. Um, so a lot of what we do is uh, taking nature and exploring scientific uh, simulations of that. But then we also just go from the, um, the look of some things in nature and try to figure out how we can create tools that are really accessible to anybody that allow to, you to create that sort of complexity. Wow, that's fascinating, and it looks like it works really well, really fluid. I like that. We're trying. Um, and this is a picture of uh, crystals that actually form from food coloring. This picture is by Lyndon Gledhill. He's done a lot of really interesting microscopic visualizations of these formations. Um, for this one, we're really interested in how they grow these almost sort of interlocking patterns. If you look at the positive image, so the crystal itself, the red, versus the negative image, which is just the background black, you can see how they're sort of really interlocking with each other. So we were interested in, could we take this type of system and actually turn it into something for a jigsaw puzzle, which is in some ways quite random. But we had this idea that we were interested in making one-of-a-kind uh, jigsaw puzzles, where every single one is different. 
And additionally, we wanted to make it so the pieces sort of grow into one another, so you always have um, a unique variation in pattern. So what you're seeing now is simulation that we created based on how those dendritic crystals form in the previous image, where we sort of are planting seeds all through space, and then we're growing each one into each other through a simulation that's uh, mimicking, in some ways, how supercooled fluids of certain metals uh, form crystals when they are solidifying. And then um, this isn't actually 3D printed. This is laser cut, but it's a computer-controlled machine that allows you to make really interesting shapes economically and quickly. So it's a similar type of tool in some ways. Yeah, I love that. Man, those, those are so cool, the way that they just bleed into each other and kind of grow around each other in a really fascinating way. And if you grow that thing in 3D, just FYI, you get something that looks kind of like this. You can't see it very well, but it's in my little webcam picture. Oh, very Crazy cool. three-dimensional branching growths. That's really great. I yeah, love that. Yeah, looks like a piece of coral or something. Ooh, and my favorite thing. Oh, and this, I like this. this last thing is a project we're working on right now that's about how can we use 3D printers' ability to make very complex structures um, to make objects that have sort of movement to them. So this dress is something that we're currently trying to fabricate. Uh, it's made up of about 3,000 different separate interlocking components that are hinged together, sort of like this thing I'm holding now. And those hinges allow it to move. And we're sort of pairing our ability to simulate um, the movement of those to fold it into a small shape so you can fabricate big objects in a small machine. That, oh, man, that's so beautiful. I love the movement in that piece. It just, it just flows really nicely. And I am going to stay very closely watching you guys for that one because <laughs> I love that so much. And, you know, you're, all of your... You know, your it, creations are so closely inspired by nature and the world around you in these organic forms. Is there a way that maybe our campers can bring this into their own making and be inspired themselves? Um, my sort of number one thing that I do to get inspired is I actually just do something really simple. I go outside and I walk around and I try to look really closely at everything that there is. And it doesn't matter if you're in like a beautiful forest or if you're in an urban environment. There are always natural things growing. Um, lichen especially are interesting to me and you'll see them everywhere. In the urban environment, look on like trees, look on rocks. If you're out in a forest, obviously you can see tons of things. What I'm normally look, just looking for is the way in which different forms in nature, maybe they're organic forms and maybe they're inorganic, so it could be rocks, it could be trees, um, the way that they mimic each other. So something like the way ice crystals also look like lightning or the way that tree branches might look like a river delta uh, the way that lichen, which are actually fungus and uh, algae, actually look like plants, even though they're, they're completely biologically different. And what does that imply about how they're growing and forming? Um, what sort of algorithms are behind that? That's a really interesting take. And uh, you know what, campers, that is a very <laughs> unconventional challenge and call to action for you. Go outside and look at nature. <laughs> this camp is all virtual. But go and be inspired. And maybe bring that into your yarn bowl for today. I would like to see some, some nervous system-esque designs forming out of that, for sure. Nervous system-esque. Is there, seeing as you've kind of created a de facto form language for 3D printed objects, do you have a nice name that you've titled that yet? Or should we just keep calling this stuff nervous system-esque? <laughs> nervous system-esque sounds great to me. All right. Perfect. Yes. Thank you for validating my word choices. Awesome. <laughs> it sounds better than things with lots of holes in them. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way to go, too. And slightly more Google friendly. <laughs> so we'll keep that one up. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. Please stay with us. We're going to be giving you a bunch of questions from campers in, in just a second here, coming up right after this. Gotta love that music, right? <laughs> Gets to me every time. Welcome back to beautiful 3D printing day at Maker Camp. We're here with Carla Diana, author of the book Leo the Maker Prince, and Jessica Rosencratz from Nervous System. Counselors, how are those questions from the campers coming? They've been rolling in like crazy, Sam. Awesome. Uh, Skylar asks Jessica, do you make prints with fractals? 
And Carla also wants to know, what's your favorite shape to print in? OK, well, it's, it's kind of a long explanation, but I'm going to go with typically no. We don't work with fractals, although I get asked that a lot. We typically work with processes that are sort of bottom-up processes, so processes where the form emerges uh, from a set of interactions uh, or simulations, whereas fractals tend to be a descriptive process where you're sort of doing something over and over and over again, and it yields sort of a particular result. So no, my answer. <laughs> That's a really interesting distinction <laughs> about that. And it's also very organic. Like, your, your art, your, it, is, it grows, and it creates itself almost. Fractals can also be very organic. It's just mathematically different. Um, what was the second question? Uh, what was your favorite shape to print in? What is my favorite shape? And that, to print that was in? a question for both you and Carla. I'll let Carla go with that first. <laughs> oh, my favorite shape. That's interesting because all my shapes are really tend to be informed by um, things that I draw. Um, so although I think my favorite shape, and this is really fun to do on the camera, my favorite shape were, were these glasses. <laughs> very nice. Very, very nice. It's autobiographical. And I've been working on some um, pairs of uh, glasses for myself. So I actually took an old pair of glasses and I uh, took the lenses out and then I put the lenses on a scanner so that I could trace their outline perfectly. And then I have been trying to see what kind of shapes I might like so that I could wear them myself. So Those it's kind of really cool. going back and forth to fiction and reality. <laughs> yeah, these are, these are just in progress, but thanks. Okay, Nick, you got to print me some of those glasses in the lab when we, when we get off of this, uh, this hangout today. Okay, all right, I think we can make that happen. Um, but uh, for now, uh, Janice has a, a quick question for Carla, and she wants to know if uh, Leo the Maker Prince will have any more adventures in the near future. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm actually in the process of figuring out where Carla and Leo go next, and they are... Um, going to be up to some really fun stuff where they're doing some drawing and designing in software. Because for um, the Leo book, what's great about it is that it will let you print the objects and it will teach you about 3D printing. But I would love for readers then to be able to go one step further and make their own drawings. So this next book is going to have Carla doing some drawing and sharing what that process is and how it relates to what you would do in the software. Cool, very cool. Maybe you could have some uh, some organic designs in there coming in from from nervous system inspiration. Mm -hmm. yes, Although personally, definitely. personally, I would love to see some some awesome Leo the Maker Prince crime fighting. Oh. I think they make a pretty good oh. duo. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. I'll have to get work. I'll have to get noodling on that. <laughs> yeah, instead of glasses, you can then have like a bandana. Uh -huh. <laughs> or like we could do a spider web, which would be an organic, uh, organic shape as well as uh, self-defense somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I like I like the ideas. They're just popping out. All right, counselors, do you have anything coming through? Yeah, we've got one more question for both of you, actually. Salvador wanted to know uh, which printer is best for prototyping, and can you build your own printer? Well, the printer that's best for prototyping is the printer that you can afford to use and that you understand how to use. So <laughs> really, whatever you have access to is probably going to be the best printer for prototyping. And you can definitely build your own printer. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> if you're really excited about it, then do it. If you're not, then it's not really essential to knowing how to use a printer to build your own printer. That's my answer. I don't know what mm -hmm. other people's answers are. I think that's a great answer. I mean, because, you know, as a designer, the thing that's the most important to prototyping is to be able to do what we call iterating, right? So to understand that the first time you design something, you're going to get many things wrong. But you won't know what those things are until you try to design it and actually make it real. So being able to print a lot and print over and over and stop the print 
uh, is really going to be the best kind of situation you can have. Yeah, that's that's good. I, I definitely like those answers. That it's really about it's more about what you do with the machine that you have and how you create it. Even if it's even if you don't have a machine, you're just using yarn and glue and working your way up to a machine. Although I wouldn't recommend building a 3D printer out of yarn and glue. It probably wouldn't work out too well. You can give it a try. Yeah, well, okay, you'll get on it, and uh, we'll have one tomorrow. Just totally ready for you guys. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> Now, I, I know that uh, in your book, Carla, you talk about a bunch of different types of 3D printing. Can you maybe talk a little bit and share with our guests about what types of 3D printing are out there and maybe which one is your favorite out of all of the different iterations of 3D printing? Oh, sure. Yes, well, we talk in the book, the, it was very important to me that the characters go through um, seeing a lot of different materials. So. There are um, robot characters that are all 3D printers, and some of them are um, they are fused deposition printers, which are doing kind of what we're doing with the yarn bowl and laying one layer at a time, and the layers stick together and build up. And then there are sintering robots in the book as well, which are using a laser light to fuse the um, the material together, uh, whether it be a resin or a powder. Um, but what I was really trying to do as well was give a glimpse of the future, because right now we think about plastic when we think about 3D printing. But um, it's also possible to print in ceramic. So um, the planter that I talked about is made out of ceramic. And then there's also a character in the book who loves math and uses algorithms. And um, she has a printer that prints in metal. And these are actually done with the Shapeways service, but um, we can foresee in the future that there might be processes that are accessible. You don't know, we'll see. Um, but it was, again, it was really important to me to give a glimpse into the future and give a sense that we'll be using lots of different materials and not just the plastic that we're used to seeing. That's great. Yeah, there's so many. I mean, when I first heard about 3D printing, it seemed like magic to me. And then as I've slowly gotten used to it, it seems like awesome science, but it's still really mystifying when you get a new technology coming in that offers you new uh, new capabilities. And, and I'm really excited about that, for sure. And actually, um, just to jump back over to Jessica, we actually went on a fun little nature walk to get inspired this morning because we have a beautiful garden. You can't see it, but there's a beautiful garden over there. Maybe I'll post a picture on the community page afterwards. But we have a beautiful garden next to us, and we actually went through and pulled some really cool things here so you could take a look. I mean, anything from like this cute little flower that's got its own little fractal designs. I can't get that close <laughs> to the camera because it is very far away. But there's some really beautiful designs here and leaves with their with their vein patterns running along them. I'll take pictures of these and post them up on the community page so you can see, uh, so you can be inspired by our foliage. And I also want you to post pictures of yours so that we can be inspired by what you have near you because we have campers from all over the world. I mean, there's there's got to be some really awesome things that I have never seen. So try to stump me and post something I've never seen. And this one is really beautiful. Um, you can kind of see it there. It's got all of these awesome kind of spiny, spindly bits and uh, really beautiful colors. So you don't have to just be inspired by texture, but also all of these colors, too. And I don't even know what this is, but this is really <laughs> cool because it's got uh, it's got all these spiny bits and then a bulb and then some spiky bits and I want campers name this for me. Find a name <laughs> that you think is awesome and tag me in it on the Google Plus community page because I want to know what you think this should be called. And if you know the actual answer, that is no fun. Find a cooler name for it. And uh, yeah, so definitely post your pictures from your nature walk on the Google Plus community page. I'm so excited to see them because I am so inspired after today. And because of that, I want to thank both of our guests. Thank you so much, Carla, Diana. Your book is amazing, and I love it, and I'm recommending it to everyone that I know. It's a really great, easy introduction, not too intimidating, but informative and not dumbed down. 
way to look at 3D printing. And Jessica Rosencrantz, your artwork is so beautiful and inspiring. I just absolutely love it, and thank you for letting me consume it so often. So <laughs> I am going to be watching for that dress to come out in the future for sure. And again, campers, thank you so much for your questions and your interaction on the community page. You have been so much fun the past couple of days. The past couple, the past week and a half, I've had so much fun interacting with you. So thank you, all of you, for that. It's been good stuff. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another awesome show. We're going to have MIT researcher Ji Key here. She's going to be talking about crafting with electricity. She is pioneering ways of experimenting with conductive inks, conductive pens, and paper, and circuit stickers. So it's going to be a fun one. And campers, and undoubtedly, you have to have been inspired by what was on the show today, because I definitely am. And since you all are awesomely inspired, remember, do try this at home. Goodbye, campers. Take care.